We have Henry Washington on. Henry, I really appreciate your time. Before we kick things off, I want to send everybody to go grab a copy of your book, How to Finance Deals with Little to No Money Utilizing Small Banks. And they can find that at henrywashington.com. I, I can't believe you managed to get that domain name because that has to be a pretty <laughs> common name, but uh, uh, that's awesome. Uh, so I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes. We're going to touch a little bit on your book today, but I really appreciate your time, Washington, uh, Mr. Washington. This is going to be great. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Man. I love I love coming on shows and and, and talking real estate. And uh, yeah, the domain name was a. Uh, it was taken and they gladly sold it to me for, for some, some cash. <laughs> yeah. It always yeah. takes some cash, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it's your name. So absolutely. anyway, uh, so you've done a little bit of everything, including fixing, flipping and wholesaling, but your primary game right now is buy and hold. But I always love to know, you know, you've been in the game for quite a while now. Well, three, four years, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, you you have a portfolio of, of rentals. According to what I was uh, given or what I found online, you're at 65. You're probably more than that by now. Yeah, we closed on a couple in the past few days, but yeah, 65 is a fair a fair number. So, um, how did you manage to pull? First of all, how did you get, how did you get into this real estate game? Yeah, man. Uh, so before I got started. Well, the reason I got started was I got married pretty quickly. So I met my wife and then 365 days later, we got married. And um, the significance of that is prior to being married, I had a great job, uh, you know, six figure income, uh, IT professional. I, I was also very good at spending all the money I made. I didn't have a financial education or financial background. So saving wasn't a thing for me. Spending definitely was. So it doesn't matter if you make six figures, five figures. 15 an hour, 8 an hour, if you spend more than you make, you're broke. So I was very good at doing that. And that's okay when it's just you. Like I didn't have anybody else to look out for besides myself. And then when you get married so quickly, I realized that like that lifestyle doesn't work when you're married. And so when we started to try to do things like buy a house together, I didn't have the money or the credit to do it. We started talking about things like What's our future going to look like as far as where we're going to live? What's our dream home going to look like? How many kids are we going to have? And I was like, I can't afford to do any of those things. And, and so like that realization that that I I didn't have the finances or the know-how to be a provider was pretty devastating for me in lack of a better term. And so I had a panic attack at three in the morning after my wife and I had one of those conversations, literal, literal panic attack, sweating, sweat, just shaking just all of it and so i started googling as one does at three in the morning when you're worried about money you start googling how do i make more money i started seeing articles about passive income and and so i dug into this passive income concept and i just started seeing everything about real estate articles about real estate videos about real estate and I, i've always like i've always liked real estate or what i thought real estate was at the time and so I ended up landing on a TED talk about this kid who was 20 some odd years old. He was financially free because he had real estate. And the, the title of the TED talk was how to design your dream life through passive income. And I was like, yep, that's what I'm looking for. So I watched the video. The kid talks about having 20 some odd doors and not having to have a job anymore and can do whatever he wants. And I was like, is that all it takes? Like I didn't like for me. I had always thought real estate was something for the super wealthy. Like I didn't think regular people own real estate. I thought like corporations are wealthy people on real estate. And so like, I didn't think that I could own, but you know, properties like that. And so once I saw that video, I was like, Oh, this is a thing people do. Well, I'll just figure out how to do it. And so I just at three in the morning that I was going to get into real estate and I was going to be good at it. Like I literally made that decision. And so I started immersing myself in real estate, like, podcasts, books, audio books, like any, anything, any moment I had, I was absorbing content. I started going to any real estate investment meetup I could find in my local area. Cause I was like, if I'm going to do this, I just need to be around people who are doing it and I'll figure it out. And so I just got around investors all the time. Every meeting I was there, every meeting. 
And then I would uh, just started telling people I was an investor. I didn't know how I was going to be an investor. I didn't have the money or the credit, but I just, I knew I was going to figure it out. And so I just started telling people I was a real estate investor because if I didn't believe I was going to do it, why should anybody else? And, uh, and that is what led me to my first deal. Uh, I had a, a good buddy of mine heard through the grapevine that I was buying investment properties and he was in a tough situation with his house or a house that he owned. And he had to sell it within 30 days because he had to go buy something else. And he brought it to me and he was like, Hey, can you buy this? I know it's worth way more than this, but I just need to sell it for this amount as long as I can sell it within 30 days because I need the cash. I need this exact amount of cash so that I can go buy this other property. And I was like, sure, man, I'll buy it. Again, I didn't know how. I had started working on my credit, so my credit was better at the point, but I didn't have any money. I had about $1,000 in my savings account. And so um, the benefit to me surrounding myself with other investors was now I had this like sounding board of other investors to help me figure out how to turn my 1000 into 19 to 20,000, which is what I needed to buy the property. And uh, that network of investors led me to learning what a 401k loan was. And that led me to my wife because I was bad with money and did not have a 401k. So we borrowed from hers. And so I borrowed 19,000 from my wife's 401k. We bought that property. That property started cash flowing. The cash flow paid back the 401k loan plus paid all the expenses for the rental. And like that was my light bulb moment moment to know that like, well, real estate's super powerful because I just took money that was not real. Like I took monopoly money and bought a real like cash flowing asset. And then like then the bank that I borrowed it from allowed me to take out a line of credit on the equity in the property I just purchased. And then I had access to like another 20 grand to go buy another property. And like to go from a panic attack to 90 days later, somebody saying, hey, you have a house now. So here's another 20 grand to go do it again. But that was my loan to me. And so I knew like I'd stumbled. You know, you, you, you said a couple things there that really st- stands out. <clears throat> it, you are a perfect example of people we have as humans, we have a tendency of reacting to pain versus mm-hmm. trying to seek out pleasure in a, in a, in, in life, you know, it, it typically takes pain or a significant idea of your why in order to take some similar to significant action. In your case, you uh, literally had a panic attack that drove you to the action that you, that to the point where you took the action and made the steps to acquire that first rental property. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100% what happened. And it, you know, I, I, what I, what I realized, like, is that three in the morning, I made a decision, right? And I didn't understand the power of decision at that point. But, you know, as an investor, as an entrepreneur in general, right? Like roadblocks are going to happen. Things are going to try to knock you off your path. And it's usually like your why that keeps you going or like, but there's little tricks you can do. And one of those tricks is like the power of decision, just deciding you're going to do something just kind of keeps your brain focused on like how to maneuver around obstacles because you've already made the decision that you're going to do it and be good at it. So your brain starts thinking of how to like a maneuver around challenges. Whereas when you don't decide and you're just kind of giving something a go, like I'll give it a shot, your brain hits the roadblock and then it doesn't think of anything else. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and so you think you can't do it. And, uh, and so like, that's been beneficial now that I can look back and, and learn that lesson because now I can apply that to, to new challenges in my life. And, you know, another thing that you said is that, or that I find really neat is that you kept saying yes. Like your buddy came to you saying they needed to, to uh, sell this house. You immediately, your first reaction was to say yes, and then figure it out. You know, that, that goes back to rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki has been teaching that from the beginning is that instead of saying no, and saying, this isn't going to work. You asked and figured out how is this going to work? And you figured it out. That's a big mindset set. So did you have to work your way to towards that, towards that mindset? Or do you naturally have that mindset? I think there's a little bit of both, right? So my life, so I had some significant events in my life that kind of gave me a different mindset. Um, one being my father was a high school art teacher. That was he did. That's what he did for his, his nine to five. But teachers don't make a ton of money. Mm-hmm. And in order to, you know, in order to live the lifestyle my dad wanted to live, um, 
he picked up side hustles. So he always was like an entrepreneur. He he had he had he owned an arcade back when you had to go someplace to play video games. He owned. Uh, he probably a had a few of my quarters. Yeah, right, right, absolutely. <laughs> he had a he had a video he had a a barbecue restaurant for about ten years. I spent most of my adolescence growing up in a, in a barbecue restaurant. He used to grow plants at home and go sell them at the swap meet. So he always like I always saw him have a business of some kind outside of his day job he never talked to me about entrepreneurship like we never had the conversation he was never like hey you gotta have you know go go start your own thing too like he was always hey get your education go to college get a good job like that was the path he wanted me to be on but i saw him take the other path too and and so i just it was all that seed had been planted right and so when it was time for me to take risks I wasn't afraid to take them because I saw an example of success my whole life of like doing your own thing and being successful at it. So there wasn't a ton of fear as far as like deciding to just do something, say yes and figure it out. And and the other things that kind of help with that is the biggest decisions I've made in my life, I've kind of, you know, divine timing has kind of helped it. And so like I went to, I went to college out of, across the country on a whim just decided to do it didn't never live that far away from home and it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life i ended up moving to arkansas from virginia beach to come work for walmart out of the blue walmart just found my resume and offered me a job in arkansas and when you're living in virginia beach and somebody asked you to come move to arkansas it's like the last thing and uh but i did it and it turned out to be one of the best decisions i ever made i met my wife and you know now married with kids and so like that's always been in the back of my mind like when you've done things that have been scary or uh are challenging it's always worked out really well and so uh it just it, it, that helps me when i when i go through other situations like that yeah so be, just to remind everybody you can find a lot of information on how to connect with uh henry at henrywashington.com and uh there's a lot of resources there but you can also grab his book so one of the things that you you mentioned that you know, staying on the topic of mindset this this was huge, and I thought it was a mic drop moment that uh, people needed to pay attention to. You said if uh, you started calling yourself a real estate investor, and until and, and until you believe it, nobody else is going to. Tell me a little bit about that. Was that a was that just by did you pick up that somewhere or did you? No, I don't think I read that anywhere or anything like that. I just I just. I believe like, uh, you know, on, on Christian, I believe in God. And I just feel like in this world, we, we get what we give, right? Like if you want something, the best way to get it is to give it, put it out there. Right. And so I just kind of took that mindset and did that with being an investor. Like the best way to become an investor is just tell people you're an investor investor write it down whatever it is for you like then your actions start to follow suit like subconsciously you just start to do stuff that aligns you to that thing that you've spoken into existence and so like i mean when you think about it like if if you want to smile from somebody what's the best way to get one smile at them right mm-hmm. if you if you want somebody to punch you in the stomach what's the best way to get a punch in the stomach <laughs> punch somebody in the stomach right so you just you just put it out there and um uh, you know, it paid off. It paid off. Yeah, no, you know, we, we've been told, you know, I've had a lot of guests come on talking about the power of affirmations, but this is, people don't see this. This is an affirmation that you're, you're, you're saying it over and over and over to yourself and to the people around you. It becomes, you become a real estate investor. You start to believe it. And that's where your mindset actually has to be. Absolutely, man. It It was, you know, you know, especially with new investors, right? That you, you know, they come on, they hear podcasts, they hear people talking, they're like, "Oh, it's another guy just telling me to just say it out loud, and it'll become a thing." Like, like I get it, like I get how that sounds corny, but man, it works. Man, it works. Just do it. I, well, I was one of those guys. I I yeah. told, I was completely convinced it's all a bunch of hooey, <laughs> and then <laughs> you know, this whole affirmation stuff writing it down, the dream boards, all of that stuff is a bunch of hooey. What a waste yeah. of time. But there is so much power there. And and I I would make the argument yeah. that that is probably, we talk yeah, about man. investing in real estate. We talk about doing 401k borrowing. We do all of this stuff. But I, I strongly believe that the biggest return on investment is 
your mindset and in getting doing a lot of these activities. Absolutely, man. I I, I did this, so I, I was similar to you. Like I listened to a, a, I think it was a YouTube video from Steve Harvey, who talked to any in, in his video. He was talking about everybody he knows that's successful has a vision board. He went to some conference and everybody had a vision board, and he was like, "Well, I need to give me a vision board." And I was like, "Man, this is a vision, whatever, man." And so I was like, "What could it hurt? I'll just do a vision board on like." on like clip art and then i'll stick it on my phone background right and so i have it i have it right here I don't know oh that's it. a great idea and so like if you look at it when you look at it there's like six or seven pictures and everything on there that i got done in like a matter of a few months with mm-hmm. the exception of like going to to singapore or not singapore new zealand because covid but everything else it was like i did it <laughs> like and, that's, and, I, and I didn't like, I didn't, it's not like I, I um, did anything else super special after I put them on my vision board. I was like, I'll just put some stuff on my vision board and uh, I'll just, you know, keep growing my business like I'm growing my business. And it was just like, that's done. That's done. That's done. It's crazy, man. So you're going to, you're going to have to tell us the truth. You're going to New Zealand now just to go through the Lord of the Rings cosplay right <laughs> you, you, you got me star wars didn't they film star wars so yeah that probably t- tells how much of a nerd i am uh, uh, no, that's okay I'm, I'm i'm a i'm a certified dork man technology <laughs> guy star wars nerd uh, i love it man so let's talk about your book for just a couple minutes mm-hmm. you you talk in your book it is it is called how to finance deals with little to no money utilizing small banks Mm-hmm. Like, how did you find that strategy? So, man, I really stumbled on it, to be honest with you. And so I use uh, small local banks. I use commercial financing for these residential deals. And I have worked for worked for a bank, but she was an auditor. But that means she had lots of friends who worked for banks. And so she had a friend who had gone into like the commercial lending arm of one of these small regional banks. And so when we were first getting started and I put that deal under contract, I went to my wife and I was like, how do we buy this? <laughs> I have no idea. And she was like, well, go talk to so-and-so. And so she worked at the small bank. I went to the small bank and that's when I learned that like these small banks have commercial products that are made for real estate investors to buy rehab and either sell or rent out properties. I was like, super awesome. She was like, yeah, we'll give you. So the bank finance is typically 85% of the purchase price. Then the small bank also gives me a hundred percent of what I need to renovate the property. So I just have to come with the, with the 15% typically down payment. And so um, I started to use those types of loans and then started to learn that these banks and these smaller loans, these portfolio lenders can be a little more flexible with these terms. And so then I started to develop the relationships and learn how to get the terms and rates and things that I want, and then learned how to not even have to bring money for down payments. And so typically now I'm, I'm finance deals and uh, I just wanted to like put all that information in like a blueprint for people both. And so like the, the book will teach you not only like how you can get really, really good financing with little to no money out of your pocket, but like what are the things you need to be doing on the front side to prepare yourself to walk into a bank and ask them to finance the majority of your deal? Like you can't just walk in there like Joe Schmo, right? You gotta, you got, they have to know you are serious. They have to, you know, see what kind of work you've done in the past. If you've done any, so I, I just go through the whole, the whole spiel, all the lessons I learned, all the things I did wrong, um, you know, and then some of the things I did right. No, you're absolutely right. It's the smaller banks. If you if you tack, go to these larger banks, it's it's pretty much everything is set in stone. You if you don't check off every one of their box boxes, they're not interested. It's that personal relationship with a small bank that you might have. We might get some traction. Absolutely. So, well, one more time, uh, head over to henrywashington.com, get the free book learn how to uh, finance deals with little or no money utilizing small banks. But before I let you go, Henry, what is the question you wished I would have asked you here today? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Uh, Let's see. Yes. I like telling new investors what's the one thing they should be focused on when starting a real estate investment business. Okay. What is the one thing they should focus, focus on when starting a real estate investing business? 
that's a phenomenal question. So I like to tell <laughs> real estate investors that <laughs> look, real estate is uh, it's a powerful investment vehicle, right? Because there's so many different ways to get involved in real estate, right? Do you wholesale? Do you flip? Do you use bank financing? Small banks, big banks, hard money, private money? Like, how do you get into the game, right? There's so many things, and I tell people if you're brand new. No matter what strategy you want to use, whether it's flipping, wholesaling, wholetailing, you know, buy and hold, there's one common denominator that you need in order for any of those strategies to be successful, right? And that means you need to be able to find and buy a good deal, right? If you don't have a good deal, none of those strategies work, right? So if you're brand new, filter out all the noise. All you should be focused on is learning what a good deal looks like in your market and then learning how to go find and buy that good deal, right? So learning what a good deal is, getting your real estate investment groups, meetings, meetups, online, in person, doesn't matter. If local investors are in a gathering space, you need to be in that space too. Then find the movers and the shakers and go ask them about their deals. Say, hey man, tell them about your last deal. What'd you do, right? Real estate investors love talking about real estate. They love talking about their good deals. Like they'll, they'll, they'll Oh, man, yeah, we bought this house over here, man. We put about 30 into it. We sold it for this. Oh, no kidding, right? What else did you do, right? And so that all that is giving you information about what price points you should be buying at in certain areas, right? And how you should be dis- dispositioning those properties. Take that information and then go figure out how you're going to find those deals. Are you going to do it on the MLS? Are you going to use direct mail? Are you going to cold call? Are you going to text message? Whatever that strategy is, pick one and just go at it full speed until you find a deal. Once you find that deal, then worry about everything else. Then worry about how you're going to finance it. Then worry about who the title company is going to be. Worry about the contractor. I'm not saying all those things after that aren't important. I'm just saying they aren't important until you have a deal. Who cares who's going to flip, who's going to do the work on your house if you can't find one to buy? So that's my my two cents. And I can't, I I think that's the most perfect way to end this interview. I really appreciate your time, Henry. This was great. Again, head over to henrywashington.com, grab the free book, and uh, I hope uh, you'll consider coming back on sometime. Oh, man, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for having me.